Okay, so I'm going to be going through all of the exam questions that have been asked about proportion. And this topic does come up in a lot of different places, so these are the ones that I think kind of focus on it mostly. And in the first part of this video on proportion, I'm going to be looking at kind of worded questions. So you can download this document and it will give you all of the same things I've got here, they're fully hyperlinked. So I'm going to be covering everything in here, all the way up to the worded section, and then algebraic I'm going to do in a separate video. Okay, so let's get going with this first question that we've got here, and it's a calculator paper. It says, in London, one litre of petrol is 108.9 pence, and in New York, one US gallon of petrol costs $2.83, and then they give us some conversions there. In which city is petrol better value for money, London or New York? And you must show your working. So I think we need to convert either the London and the litres and the pounds all into the sort of American style of measurement, or we need to do it the other way around. And it really doesn't matter which way you do this, but I'm probably going to convert the New York stuff to the London kind of thing. So for New York that we've got here, we've got one US gallon of petrol is 283. Now, one US gallon is 3.785 litres. So 3.785 litres is $2.83. Now, if I want to find out how much one litre is so that I can compare it, I'm going to just divide it on this side. I'm going to do the $2.83 divided by 3.785. And that's going to tell me the number of dollars that it would be just for one litre. So let's just do 2.83 divided by 3.785. So one litre is going to be 0 0.7476, etc. dollars. And then we want to use the conversion fact that we've got here, which is to go from dollars to pounds. Now, if we're going backwards, we're going to be dividing by 1.46. So now what I'm going to do is for one litre, I'm going to convert this from dollars to pounds. So I'm going to be doing my 0 0.7476 divided by 1.46. And that should tell me how much it's going to be in pounds. So in New York, one litre is 0 0.746, which is the number I've got on my calculator. I'm going to divide that by 1.46, and in pounds, this is 0 0.51 pounds, or 51 pence. And because 51 pence is cheaper than 108.9 pence that we've got here, we can say that the petrol is cheaper in New York. Petrol is cheaper in New York. 51 pence is less than 108.9 pence. And there's loads and loads of different ways of doing this comparison. But it is cheaper in New York. And I think we've got here, there's quite a lot of these different comparisons. They actually haven't got the, the true numbers with this, but the correct answer is going to be uh, the 51 pence there for that one. Okay, now we're going to have a look at this next question. This is about recipes that we've got. So Deal needs 50 grams of sugar to make 15 biscuits. Then we've got some information about the flour and the butter. And it says that Dion is going to make 60 biscuits. So this means that we're going to need the recipe of 15 biscuits. If we're wanting to make 60, we take that recipe and we multiply it by 4. So we need to work out the amount of flour. And the flour says that it's three times as much flour as sugar. So let's begin by working out how much sugar is needed. Well, we need 50 grams for 15 biscuits, so we're going to times that by 4 for the 60 biscuits, which is 200 grams. And then for flour, it says that they need 3 times as much flour as sugar. So we're going to take the sugar and we're going to times it by 3 and we get the answer of 600 grams needed for this part. It then says that Dion has to buy all the butter she needs to make 60 biscuits. She buys the butter in packs of 250 grams. Um, so how many packs of butter does she need? Well, we're going to use the second fact, which is about the butter is two times the sugar. So the butter is going to be the sugar amount, because it's still for 60 biscuits, times by two, which is 400 grams. And one pack is 250 grams, which isn't going to be enough. So two packs would be for 500. So that's enough for us to say she needs two packs. Uh, she needs two packs. So let's check we've got that right. Yep, yeah, we've got the 600 grams and we've got the two packs here. Okay, this time we have got something which I call like sample and population. So it's kind of comparing a smaller sample to the wider population that you're studying. So it says Hannah is planning a day trip for 195 students and she asks a sample of 30 where they want to go. Each student chooses one place and here is the table. Work out how many of the 195 students you think will want to go to the theme park. 
So she asked 30 people and 10 out of the 30 people wanted to go to the theme park. So 10 out of 30, we don't have to simplify this, but 10 out of 30 is a third. So in other words, a third of the people want to go to the theme park. So we're just going to work out a third of 195, which you could either type in as a fraction, or we could just do 195 divided by 3. So I think that there are going to be 65 people who will want to go to the theme park. State any assumptions that you've made and explain how this may affect your answer. Well, we've made this prediction according to the sample. We think that the sample represents the whole population or the sample represents the whole group. If they don't, then our answer could be wrong. So I'm just going to write that down. The assumption that we've made is that the sample represents all the students. If not, our answer might be wrong. If not, our answer may be wrong. So let's have a look at this. We've got the 65 and the statement that the sample is representative um, and the thing in brackets, otherwise the answer is wrong. And there's some other things that you could say there. So I'll just leave that for you if you want to have a look. Okay, we've got another sample and population question here. This time we're talking about people going to a fitness club and they get your free gift. Stan is going to order the gifts. Stan takes a sample of 50 people in the fitness club. He asks each person to tell him what gift they would like and the table shows information about his results. And there are 700 people in the fitness club. Work out how many sports bags Stan should order. So for the sports bags, 17 out of 50 people wanted the sports bags. And we want to find that fraction of the 700 people that are in the fitness club. So I'm going to type this one in as a fraction. I'm going to do my 17 out of 50. And I'm going to multiply that by 700. So it is 238 sports bags, 238 bags should be ordered. And then the answer for part two of the question is literally the same as what we did on the previous page. So I'm just going to say the assumption that we made is that the sample is representative. And if not, our answer could be wrong. Let's check we've got this right. So 238 bags and the sample is representative, otherwise the answer is wrong. And again, there's different things there that you can have a look at if you want to see if you've got them right or not. Okay, this time it's with area of rectangles. Now with proportion, there's loads of different ways of doing this. So if you do it differently to me, then that's absolutely fine. Uh, Maisie knows that she needs three kilograms of grass to make a rectangular lawn, which is five by nine. So immediately I'm going to write down that three kilograms is going to do an area of five multiplied by nine, which is 45 meters squared. So three kilograms is going to be doing an area of 45 meters squared. Grass seed is sold in two kilogram boxes. Maisie wants to make a rectangular lawn 10 by 14 metres and she has five boxes of grass seed. Does she have enough grass seed? So probably the way that I would do this is work out how much is in one box. So I could work out one kilogram by dividing both sides by three. And I'm actually going to then find out how much two kilograms or one box is because I'm just going to double that so I get 30 metres squared. So we know that one box is going to cover 30 metres squared and she's got five boxes. So if I times that by five on both sides, I get 150 meters squared. Now the garden that she wants to do is 10 by 14, which is 140 meters squared. So she has enough. The reason she has enough is because 150 is greater than 140. So she has enough grass seed. There's loads of different ways you could do this. This is just probably the way that my brain goes to do it. Maisie opens the five boxes of grass seed and she finds that four of the boxes contain two kilograms of grass seed and the other box contains one kilogram of grass seed. So in other words, she has one kilogram less than she expected. Does this affect whether Maisie has enough grass seed to make her lawn? Well, one kilogram is going to make 15 metres squared. So if she's got one kilogram less, she's going to have 150 take away 15 metres squared. She's only going to have enough to make 135 meters squared. So she's not gonna have enough because 135 is less than 140. So does this affect it? Yes, it, um, yet does it affect if she has enough grass seed? Yes, um, she does not have enough. She no longer has enough. 
and that's because 135 is less than the 140 that she needs. And actually this bit that I've got down here is enough kind of reference to explain why that is, because it does say give a reason for your answer. So we have got yes, that she can, and then no, she does not have for the second part. And there's lots of different bits there. But you can see, I think with the numbers, we've got the comparison of the 150 and the 140 from this part, and then the 135 and the 140 from that beginning part. Okay, so this time it's kind of, I didn't know where to put this question, but I've put it in a proportion part because it's sort of percentages, it's sort of ratio, but really it's, it's just proportion overall. So it says the volume of sphere Q is 50% more than the volume of sphere P. So the way I think about this is to go from P to Q, we have increased its volume by 50%, which is the same as multiplying it by 1.5. The volume of sphere R is 50% more than the volume of sphere Q. So to go from Q to R, we have also multiplied it by 1.5. And it wants us to find the volume of sphere P. So we're going to do the volume of sphere P as a fraction of the volume of sphere R. So I just need to sort of say what I think P's volume is. Well, you can give it any number. You could call it X if you wanted to. You could just say that it was one. You could say it was 100. I really don't mind what we say for it, but I'm just going to say that the volume of sphere P is just one. Now, if the volume of sphere P is one, then the volume of sphere R is one multiplied by 1.5 multiplied by 1.5. So just somewhere else on my page, I'm going to work out what 1.5 times 1.5 is. Well, 1.5 times 1.5, if I know that 15 times 15, and it is a non-calculator paper, but you should know that 15 times 15 is 225, or you could work that out more slowly if you needed to using like a column method or grid method. So 1.5 times 1.5 is 2.25 because there's those two numbers after the decimal point. So it's 1 over 2.25. Now, we don't normally have decimals in a fraction, so I'm going to times the top and bottom by a number that would mean we don't have those decimals. And actually, if I times the bottom by 100 and the top by 100, I get 100 over 225. Now, technically, that is the end of the question. You don't have to simplify this because it didn't ask for it to be simplified. But if you do want to simplify it, we could see what they both have in common. They're both in the 25 times table. So if I divide the top and bottom by 25, I would come up with the answer 4 over 9. But like I said, if you had 100 over 25, that is perfectly correct for this answer because it doesn't need to be simplified. And it says that at the end where it says 4 ninths. OE means or equivalent fraction. So you could have like the 100 over 225. Okay, let's see what we've got in this one. We're now looking at the first question, which is inverse proportion. And unfortunately, I've told you it's inverse proportion because usually the trickiest thing, trickiest thing is to recognize that it is that. So it says, yesterday it took five cleaners four and a half hours to clean all the rooms in a hotel. There are only three cleaners to clean all the rooms in the hotel today. Each cleaner is paid £8.20 for each hour or part of an hour they work. How much will each cleaner be paid today? So we need to find out how long it's going to take them. And really, to recognise that it's inverse proportion, it's that if there are less cleaners, it will take more time. Or if there were more cleaners, it would take less time. In fact, I'm saying more and less means that it's in inverse proportion. So I'm going to just write down this first statement, that if there are five cleaners, that is going to be 4.5 hours. Now, inverse proportion means if you multiply one side by something, you divide the other. So I'm going to do it slightly slower. You could go straight to three cleaners, but I'm going to say to go from five cleaner to one cleaner, we're dividing by five. So on this side, I'm going to multiply by five to find out how many hours it would take one cleaner to do the whole hotel, which would be 4.5 multiplied by five or 22.5 hours. Now what we're going to do is figure out what the question wanted, which was to do with three cleaners. So on this side, I am multiplying by three, which means on this side, I'm going to do the opposite, which is divide by three. So I'll do 22.5 divided by three, divided by three, which is 7.5 hours. Now it does say something really important here. It says that each cleaner is paid £8.20 for each hour or part of an hour that they work. So we're going to say each cleaner will be paid eight hours. Each cleaner is paid eight hours hours. So all we need to do now is work out what 8 times £8.20 is to find out how much one of them will be paid. So we'll do 8 times £8.20, which is £65.60. And, and we do need to write it as £65.60 because it's asked for it as money. So there's our answer of £65.60. 
Okay, the next one is also an inverse proportion. It says it would take 120 minutes to fill a swimming pool using water from five taps. How many minutes will it take if the pool only had three taps being used? Well, it's the same idea. More taps, less time. Less taps, more time. Therefore, it's going to be inverse proportion. So five taps, 120 minutes. And now I'm going to say, what would it be if there was one tap? Well, this side is dividing by five, so I'm going to do the opposite and I'm gonna multiply by five. Well, 12 times five is 60, so 120 times five is gonna be 600. And now I'm gonna think about whether it's three taps. So this side, that's tripling the number of taps, so I'm gonna divide the number of minutes by three. So three taps is going to be 200 minutes for our answer there. It then says state one assumption that you've made in working out your answer to part A. Well, we're just imagining that all of the taps have the same flow rate. If one of them had loads of water coming out and then we turned it off, that's going to affect it. So one of the things that we've assumed is that all the taps flow at the same rate. All the taps are flowing at the same rate. And they're going to accept quite a few different phrasings of this, but as long as you've kind of got that idea. So we've got the 200, and then here are the statements. The taps are running at the same speed. They're filling with the same amount of water, etc., etc. So you can kind of read through that and check if you've got a statement that seems similar to this. Okay, we've got one more in inverse proportion, I believe, and it says a company has to make a large number of boxes. The company has six machines, and all the machines work at the same rate. When all the machines are working, they can make all the boxes in nine days. The table gives the number of machines working each day. So we've got day one, day two, day three, where some of them aren't working. And then on the other days, all of them are working. Work out the total number of days taken to make all the boxes. So I think we need to look at this thing, that there are six machines, and when they are all working, they can make the boxes in nine days. So we need to find out how many days of work there need to be in total. So if we have six machines, and we're saying that they need nine days altogether, we can say that if there was just one machine, how many days would be needed? Well, this side has divided by six. So the other side is going to multiply by six. And nine times six is 54. And again, you could just check this on the calculator if you needed to, because you can see at the top, it's a calculator paper. So this means we need 54 working days. And it looks like from day one, we've got three working days. From day two, we've got four working machines. Day three, we've got five working days. Now on the other days, we've got six of them per day. And I'm just gonna let X be the number of extra days. X is the number of extra days. And so we're going to find out how many extra days where there are six machines. And now we want this all to add up to 54 because there need to be 54 working days. In other words, there need to be 54 machine working days that there are. So 3 plus 4 plus 5, that is 12. So I get 12 plus 6x equals 54. I'll subtract 12 so that I get 42. And then I'll divide by 6 so that I need seven extra days. So that means I've got day 1, day 2, day 3. And then here I need seven extra days. So the total number of days that it wanted, the total is going to be equal to seven plus three, which is 10 days. Let's check that we've got this right. Yep, it is 10 days here. And you can see this process of finding out how many machine days were needed at the beginning was really, really important for that one. Okay, the next questions are all gonna be the algebraic kinds of ones, so come back for that video um, just to make sure you've covered everything on proportion.